Welcome to the Inspire to Invest podcast, where we're sharing stories from real estate investors and how investing has changed their lives. Thank you to PropertyCast.io for bringing you this month's episodes of Inspired to Invest. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Inspire to Invest podcast. I have Matthew Frederick joining us from Vaughn today, and he's got ample experience, a few decades worth of real estate investing experience under his belt, starting with his first purchase back in 1984 when interest rates were soaring at 12.7%. Everyone's crying right now about the 6%, but he's been through much higher. And he's worked his way through six housing market crashes in Canada, as well as the United States. So he has ample experience and insights when it comes to the behaviors and strategies that can be leveraged during turbulent times like the ones that we've been experiencing over the last year to year and a half. So thank you for your time today and joining us, Matthew. How are you? I am fantastic. And uh, thank you for inviting me. So now, obviously, you've got lots of experience under your belt. But prior to 1984, like what were you doing before real estate came into the picture? And why did you decide to to move forward in that way? So I was actually... um a private vocational school teacher. So I was teaching college at that time. And uh, before that, I was into computer systems. But I actually bought my first house at 19. Um, I didn't get into investing full time until about 24, 24 and a half. So my yeah. first investment house at 19. But yeah, I was I was teaching college. And uh, I was uh, I created a little small business on how to teach people uh, how to use computers. Because back yeah. in those days, the, the personal computer had just come out. Yeah. Yeah, so that's awesome. So obviously you started out with your primary residence. What was really the catalyst then to start investing beyond that? So my primary residence, I literally rented the basement. So it was more of a, I shared the kitchen. So today you call that house hacking. Yeah, basement before it was a term. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we shared the kitchen. Back then we didn't call it house hacking. We just called it, you know, sharing a kitchen. Yeah. But uh, at about four and a half years later, my brother uh, came to me. He was a police officer and he says, hey, I want you to invest with me because you're a systems guy. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm not interested in investing in real estate. I already have my own investment property. Yeah. He says, I'm your older brother. I got a gun. You're going to invest with me. So he <laughs> forced me into the process. So everybody who yeah. got it there on their own, yeah, you know, that's pretty amazing. I got pulled into it. And then we started uh, buying properties together. I had a good income. He had a great income. Yeah. And, uh, and what did that really look like? Were you initially starting out with single family homes or, you know, was multifamily even on your radar at that point in time? Well, we started in Hamilton downtown. So we started off with uh, triplexes. Uh, so not single family homes. Yeah. Um, I mean, as a police officer, he'd go into all these properties to deal with domestics. And yeah. he said to me, hey, you know, guess what? This is a, this is a potential. Yeah. So we started off with uh, first floor, two bedroom, second floor, three bedroom, third floor would be a bachelor apartment. Yeah. We started buying those houses. And then we switched to uh, what was called a four level back split, which yeah. means we renovated the top and we renovated the basement, so two family homes. Never ever got into one single family homes. Yeah. Now, what was the price point then compared to like what that would look like on the same property today? Just to like draw that comparison. So in 1984, properties were around uh, you know 75,000 to 80,000. A triplex mm -hmm. would be about maybe about 105,000. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind that uh, someone who's working full time, an adult, is making about 35,000 a year. Yeah, so a house would be two and a half years worth of salary uh, mm -hmm. today. If you're making sixty five thousand a year, and a house is seven hundred thousand. Yeah, eleven times uh, a salary. So yeah. it's changed dramatically since then, for sure. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Now, as you started to scale, I know that you have eventually gone into things like land development and assemblies and stuff like that. Can you talk about how you jumped from you know triplexes to something like building an apartment? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we actually went from uh, the triplexes to multifamily. Mm -hmm. uh, when I say multifamily, I mean six plus. What happened is uh, at some point we had about 20 or 30 properties, probably 32 properties. Yeah. And I come home from a hard day's work. And back in those days were flip phones. I get a phone call and I'm exhausted. And I'm like, I have so many properties. I'm supposed to be rich. I have so yeah. many doors. I'm supposed to be rich. But I found that properties are like kids. I literally found myself running after them. So, <laughs> I kind of got into real estate to, let's say, you know, um, be free, but I became a slave to the property. So then we thought, you know what, why have 32 locations? Why not just start buying larger buildings? Yeah. So like 10 unit, 12 unit, 24 unit, 34 unit buildings. 
to have a superintendent or a manager manage it for us yeah. so we can actually live our lives. So that, that's why we decided to make that jump. Now, how did you finance those properties? Well, because we had the, uh, the, the houses, the duplex, triplex, we ended up selling off a few of those. We paid mm-hmm. capital gains, and then yeah. we went towards buying some of those properties. Yeah. But that's the first few. Later on, my way of financing is I'll, I would always find older property owners. When I say older, yeah. I mean 65 to about maybe 75. Yeah. And I would ask them if they want to sell. And if they wanted to sell, then uh, you know I would buy from them and I'd have them hold the mortgage. Some of them didn't want to sell, yeah. but they had lots of equity because they bought their properties a long time before. Yeah. So I was able to bore against their equity and buy other properties where I kind of JV with them. So yeah. they were too old to stay in the game from their perspective. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm still young. Why don't we buy a property together? We use yeah. your money, your credit, we JV. And that's how I was able to buy the two or $3 million buildings uh, because I had to use their money. Yeah. And I, I provided that, uh, that excitement for them because they still wanted to be in the game. Now, I know in your bio, you talk about investing across Canada as well as the United States. What markets have you primarily been focusing on? Well, that was interesting because in 1997 to about, let's say, 2003, I was an international speaker. Okay. And that meant that I was flying to different provinces every single month. And, you know, we had classes of 200 to about 500 people. Wow. I was working for an organization called Whitney. Yeah. And therefore, because I was going to different spaces to, to speak, I started investing in BC, in Alberta, in Saskatchewan, mm-hmm. in Ontario, and then throughout the U.S., because I happened to be flying in, speaking yeah. there, uh, we sold training packages, courses, yeah. mentorships, and then I would stay for a few extra days. So it wasn't driven by what market I want to be in. I just happened to be in those markets. I, I might as well take a property tour while I'm here. Yeah. Why not? Why not? <laughs> Who owns this building over here? Um, now, you obviously talked about working as a college professor. So how long did that take from you know, maybe buying your first investment property to when you were basically retiring from that role? So my first investment was at 19, but my serious investing started at 24 and a half. Yeah. So from 24 and a half to about 34 and a half, it took about 10 years for me to be able to, let's say, walk away from my job. And that was a choice because my world was closing in on me. Yeah. Um, You know, I thought, geez, you know, I'm just revisiting the same things over and over again. Yeah, but I didn't just leave tomorrow. It took 10 years to be able to have that money saved up, learn what I was doing, understand the process and actually go through a market flop. Yeah. So that once I was through a flop and I said I came out of it, I'm like, OK, I think I'm ready to walk away from my job. Yeah. People today in good times, they leave their jobs, which is not bad. Yeah. But then when a flop hits, now yeah. they have to deal with a flop without their main job. And yeah. this is how the world works today. Well, I'm sure you've seen and experienced that as well. Like so many investors right now talking about their mortgages increasing like 200, 400%. So they're barely making payments, let alone being able to take any cash flow out of the properties, even if they have hundreds of doors, right? So for you, when you made that decision, was it based on a certain volume of cash flow that you had coming in from your whole portfolio? Or was it, you know, the value of the portfolio that made you comfortable to walk away? Well, my job is paying paying about 80,000 a year. that was good. My income coming in from real estate, combined real estate, was superior to that. Yeah. And I was doing less for it. But I've always done a combination. I've always bought properties and, and held them yeah. to get cash flow. But yeah. for every three properties I have and I'm holding, I'm going to do a buy, fix, and sell for one of them to put, yeah. let's say, a lump sum of money in my pocket. Yeah. Because cash flow is great, but you cannot survive a recession with just cash flow. Yeah. That lump sum of buy, fix, and sell, or wholesaling a great deal that I secure the right to buy and I wholesale it. Yeah. That chunk of money, having both those side by side, gave me the opportunity to say, hey, you know what? Maybe it's time to, to move on. Yeah. It, it was very gradual for me. I didn't plan it. It just, I woke up one day and said, things are going pretty time. good. Yeah. I have, you know, extra time and space. I'm making okay money. I'm knowledgeable. Yeah. I put 10 years in and I just kind of slowly walked away. Yeah. Yeah. No, I always find that really interesting just to see like what people define that moment as. Now, based on everything that you have gone through in the last few years, let's just say that, what would you say <laughs> is something that you're most proud of or you look at as your biggest success? Well, incidentally, a lot of people do not like joint ventures. Uh, they want to buy that property, 
finance it themselves. And that's yeah. tremendous. But I've, I have a lot of joint ventures and I have joint ventures with single, like one person. So one yeah. person joint ventures. And I joint venture mainly with people around 45 to about, let's say, 75. Yeah. And the, the older folk, the folks who are 65 to 75, being my partner, you know, I've gained so much wisdom from them. Not, I'm not just providing money. I'm providing uh, sustenance in the sense that they feel as though they're heard, they're understood. Yeah. Someone's interested in what they've gone through. And I've grown tremendous by having older partners yeah. who would share their experiences with me. So I think that's one of the best things that I've experienced just these great people that uh, share their lives with me. Yeah. And um, I, I love it. It's amazing. Yeah, no. And I think that's, you know, it's about properties, but it's also about the people and the lives that you can impact along the way. Right. That's right. Uh, now in terms of obstacles, obviously you talked about those really high interest rates. Would you look at that as one of the biggest obstacles that you faced or would there be another, you know, market downturn that you would look at as like the biggest challenge that you'd had at, up until that point? No, I think my biggest challenge was not to do with interest. Although I, I've gone through high interest low interest. Um, it's to do with uh, me personally. Uh, two things I had issues with. Number one, I thought that if I knew my stuff and I partnered with somebody else or I did business with somebody else who didn't, I'm going to compensate for their weakness. And what I realized that some people just don't accept responsibility. They just don't see the big picture. Yeah. And I've had, to, I've had to then go in the breach and suffer, lose, mm -hmm. because those partners, whether they're uh, contractors, whether they are joint venture partners, whether they're people who are lending me money, yeah. uh, they they can't seem to pull it together. So the concept of thinking that I can actually solve all problems or the fact that I'm invincible, that caused me, let's say, a lot of strain in the past. I had to get over that and realize mm -hmm. it. You know, even SEAL Team 6 gets, uh, you know, gets killed. And then secondly, um, I jumped too fast from from one to the other. I yeah. went from, let's say, residential right to commercial, uh, even though I had multi-unit buildings, yeah. without actually understanding or taking time to learn commercial, yeah. I made some mistakes that cost me probably about four or $500,000. Yeah. In yeah. the end, the property worked out, but the pain and stress that came with it, yeah. uh, it didn't have to happen, although I didn't learn from it. So yeah. in both cases, it was more about me, not about uh, the interest rates or the market drop. Yeah. You know, that doesn't really affect me. I, I I literally would adjust to whatever is needed. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And it's a good segue into my next question in regards to lessons. So you obviously talked about maybe jumping into a bigger asset class and not necessarily doing the due diligence that you should have. So can you talk about some of those lessons that you learned? And if you could go back, is there anything you know now that you would have done differently if you knew it at that point in time? Yeah, it's the reason why I jumped into those asset classes. Uh, you know, it's funny. Um, you know, people talk about your why, you know, my why is I want to get to the moon, for instance. And, uh, you know, how do you get there? You get there with real estate, maybe, uh, your rocket, but nobody talks about the fuel. You need fuel to get from stage to stage to stage. Yeah. And the reason why I definitely jumped into some of the larger stuff, things I didn't have to is because, you know, I grew up in Canada in the seventies and, you know, I'm, I'm a visible minority and I went through some tough times, although I don't regret it. I'm okay with it. Yeah. But those times caused me to feel second class, like I'm a second class citizen. Yeah. And my confidence was very low. So sometimes I overcompensated. I used that fuel in my rocket to yeah. overcompensate to, let's say, feel equal. And, and this could be any anybody at any stage or any category. Yeah. And I drove too hard in certain areas. And then all of a sudden, when that fuel was burnt up, and I felt as though, hey, I feel equal. I had the knowledge I knew the goal, but I was spinning my wheels. I didn't realize that I needed new fuel. But yeah. that spinning my wheels, doing nothing, caused me to act too soon or act too quickly. Yeah, almost should... like you're trying to prove something. Exactly. <laughs> Whether it's just someone else or yourself, but exactly. yeah, I understand yeah. what you're saying. I should have actually found my next set of fuel and then uh, gone into that. But it's that that's in between fuels, feeling as though nothing's happening, caused me to act too soon on certain things. Yeah, so, yeah. no, I understand crazy. that. Great. So on that note, we're just going to take a really brief break for a word from our sponsors and we'll be right back. Is the real estate investment you're considering a gold mine or a landmine? Introducing PropertyCast.io, the black magic of real estate investment analysis. Use PropertyCast.io to analyze and underwrite real estate investment opportunities, unlock the potential of a property and share professional reports. 
Jordan McGregor is a commercial realtor and founder of PropertyCast.io. He identified the need to simplify and streamline how properties are underwritten to help investors make better decisions and sound investments. PropertyCast.io is a best-in-class purpose-built tool for real estate investment analysis. To find out more, go to PropertyCast.io and to sign up, click the link in the show notes. I value transparency, integrity, and trust. If you choose to work with me, you can be assured that business will be conducted honestly and openly. Time is of the essence in this industry, so you can expect nothing short of quick, clear communication from me. I'll keep you informed every step of the way so you feel comfortable throughout this entire process. Our homes are where we eat, sleep, relax, and play. My clients' best interests are at the heart of everything I do. And with this said, my service to you doesn't end when the transaction does. As your realtor, I'll not only help you buy and sell your property, I'll also educate and support you along the way. I want to help you fulfill your goal of home ownership and become your trusted real estate resource for life. I can't wait to share my passion for real estate with you. More importantly, find you the perfect house to turn into your home. Looking to buy, sell, or invest in Durham Region or Toronto? Let's chat. Inspired to Invest is proud to support the Beyond Success program. In today's complex world, it's absolutely crucial for our youth to learn how to take charge of their financial future. We believe that every young person deserves access to accurate, practical financial information. Designed to bridge the gap, the Beyond Success program leverages a comprehensive educational bootcamp to equip young minds with essential financial literacy skills. At Beyond Success, it's not just about teaching financial literacy, it's also about fostering a foundation for a prosperous and empowered future. Join us. Together, we can build a brighter financial future for the next generations. Join us. Together, we can build a brighter financial future for the next generations. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Inspire to Invest podcast. I have Matthew Frederick here with me today, and he's been investing in real estate for the past 30 years all across Canada and also into the U.S. So we're talking about some of those obstacles, challenges, and lessons that have come along with being a real estate investor. But what's the craziest thing you think's ever happened on your journey? I mean, there's been a lot of crazy things, but owning multifamily buildings, like larger buildings, let's say 12 to 64 units, yeah. I don't realize that even if you're not managing, you still have to deal with domestic crisis. So yeah. for instance, um, you know, I've actually had uh, somebody die in one of my units uh, for about two weeks before that person was discovered. Yeah. It's not, a, it's not a pretty sight. Or even, you know, the person in, in, a, in a unit A and the person in unit, let's say B, decide to meet in the laundry room and all of a sudden uh, strike up a relationship. And all of a sudden, uh, each each person's spouse finds out and the yeah. whole place goes berserk. Yeah. <laughs> domestic things like that. Or I yeah. you know, had a six unit building, had a guy who was trying to sell crack cocaine out the basement window. No, oh, no. Uh, his, his girlfriend was, um, she was a prostitute, not the expensive kind. And she literally would do her trade in the laundry room. So we have to deal with all that. You so, didn't know the laundry rooms were such bustling. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, you really have to control that laundry room, you know, yeah. shut down the times, put a camera in there. Yeah. I don't need camera for recording stuff. I just yeah. need a camera. But to deter people. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. That, that's definitely pretty crazy. But at the same time, I guess never a dull moment. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Perspective. Uh, so in terms of things like real estate education and mentorship, what would you say is some of the best advice that you've been giving and what would you suggest to maybe a real estate investor that's coming up the ranks that's trying to learn from people that have been there? Well, again, it's important to understand that you're competing against yourself. You're not looking at how many doors somebody has. You're looking to answer the question to who you are 10 years from now, yeah. because who I am today is accountable to that person 10 years from now. Yeah. And uh, that's who I have to answer to, not uh, what everybody else is having, or what everybody else has. Yeah. Uh, another thing too is, uh, sometimes when people teach, you learn stuff. People don't give exact detail. They give just a a, a, a smothering of general knowledge. Being yeah. a generalist or having general knowledge, but feeling as though you have extreme competence, that's a dangerous combination. Yeah. <laughs> it's like thinking that you know how to fly a uh, jet and then yeah. getting into that jet and realizing that you can't. So mentors are important to walk you through that process. Yeah. in order to get you there. I think that's really important to understand. 
Now, obviously you have this breadth of experience and you've got a pretty sizable portfolio. So, you know, at this point, what's next for you? Like, are you still looking to scale and grow? Or are you just kind of stabilized at this point in time? What would be, you know, your focus for the next five to 10 or 20 years? So I'm pretty stable at what I'm doing, but now I'm getting into uh, warehousing. So therefore, right now I'm working with uh, a few of the couples, um, Jacob Elias, also Amy and Nigel Brooks. We're looking at building a warehouse, 100,000 square foot warehouse uh, just outside of London. Yeah. And warehousing, uh, not just a warehouse, but a distribution center. The big difference is with warehouses, things go in and come out. Distribution, things get reorganized. Yeah. Now I'm getting into that field because industrial real estate is really one of the highest paying real estates. Subject to my my, my second best that I own is strip is um strip uh, storage. Yeah. Then strip plaza, then multifamily. So I'm, I'm looking to build uh, a, a number of hundred thousand square foot uh, uh, distribution centers across Southern Ontario. Yeah. Yeah. Now, how would you look at real estate investing and like how it's changed your life? Like, you know, what, what do you think life would look like? How do you not gone down this path? You know, it, it's a major change because I would be, although I was always entrepreneurial, I always had my own business. Mm -hmm. I find that with real estate, it, it works 24 hours a day for you. And because it's working 24 hours a day, if you have the right system in place, yeah. then I can duplicate myself. And that's the problem. A lot of people cannot duplicate themselves, create a bunch of mini, mini me's. Yeah. To me, every property that I have is a mini me, and I can have four, five, six, ten 10 uh, throughout the country and the U.S. working yeah. for me while I'm living my life. So it's important uh, to have that concept. I've had nine, I've had restaurants and Having a restaurant means you have to be there. Even if you're the owner, you have to yeah. show up. Yeah. Uh, whereas with real estate, if it's organized, you can actually pay for management. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Is there anything that you think someone that wants to aspire to maybe the scale that you've grown things that you would pass along as like, you know, if you could pass along one pearl of wisdom, like what would that be for someone that's kind of coming up the ranks? Well, two things. You know, a lot of people, uh, they read a lot of information. And uh, like for me, at the end of the year, I always read one special book. And that book's called The Book of Me, which means I spent all of December going through everything that happened to me throughout the entire year. Yeah. Just asking myself, you know, what did I do right? What did I do wrong? What can I improve on? Uh, what, did, you know, what, what went a little bit slower than I thought? And that's really yeah. important because some people pay so much more attention to other people's books, but you do have to understand what you are, are doing at the same time, I read it. I don't read that much. I read a lot of other things, mm -hmm. but I'll probably read four real estate books a year. And, you know, I might read one in January, spend uh, February learning some techniques, and then March applying them, and yeah. then do that again and again. So if I applied about 12 new techniques that I'm living and only read four books, yeah, better than reading 50 books, but not, not doing anything what you're reading. So yeah. I'd say be careful about that. Yeah, no, I think that makes perfect sense. And I think the the key is really just to get started, right? Like so many people are so nervous and apprehensive and time can go by far more quickly than you can expect. So I think to your point, just learn what you can, learn from others and take some action. Um, now, obviously the name of this podcast is Inspired to Invest. So I always like to ask people if there's a particular quote that motivates or inspires them. I think for me, it's, um, you know, fortune favors the bold. I learned to build by flying out to Alberta when they told me not to come out there, a company, and I demanded to learn to build. Everything that I've done, I've always had to risk. And I find that fortune favors the bold. You got to be bold about it. And when people say no, you kind of do it anyway. And ultimately, <laughs> that's that's something that I've always used. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Now, is there anything in particular you want to leave with anyone that could be listening or watching right now? Yeah. Uh, if you have a partner like in your business, so let's say, okay, let's say it's a, a couple. Uh, let's say there's a masculine and there's a feminine. And let's just say the feminine is doing a lot of the the groundwork, just happens to be doing a lot of the, 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 the 10 parters where you're getting the insurance done, you're ordering the stock, you're ordering supplies, you're balancing everything. And let's say the masculine in this scenario happens to be doing the physical work. And it mm -hmm. can be either one. Yeah. Masculine comes home and says, hey, I had a complete day today. I just completed the room. The feminine comes home and says, hey, I didn't get anything done, but I tried 10 things. Yeah. Masculine says to feminine, we need to get something done. That's a problem. So both parties 
have to understand that each person is doing a different role. Yeah. Although a role is not completed, you still have to respect that person for their multiple part role, as opposed to just feeling complete, because you can see at the end of the day, I put up a door. I yeah. think that's really important for, for couples and business partners to understand. Yeah. But whether it's masculine or feminine, or that's not the issue. It's just two different parties yeah. doing two different complete jobs. Yeah, no, I understand that. I think at the end of the day, a lot of people always think they're the ones that are working harder. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but if you are going to partner with someone, just having those roles and responsibilities really clearly outlined from the mm -hmm. beginning could maybe, you know, prevent some issues that could happen down the road. Uh, but that being said, thank you for your time today. If someone does want to get in touch, I know that you do have different programs coming up in terms of teaching people about various components of real estate investing, but what's the best way for them to find you and reach out? Well, they can go to my website, and that's just uh, six little characters, rccsol.com. Great. And we'll include that in the show notes below, along with your social media handles. So thank you, of course, for your time today. For anyone that has tuned in, if you have enjoyed this episode, please make sure that you like, comment, and subscribe. Make sure that you're also following along on social at Inspire to Invest podcast. And remember, when you invest in yourself, the sky's the limit. Thanks again. This episode of Inspire to Invest has been brought to you by PropertyCast.io. The views represented on this podcast are for general information only and does not constitute investment or other professional advice or an offering of securities. The host and guests featured on Inspire to Invest make no representations as to the performance of any particular investment. Should you decide to make an investment, you are responsible for conducting your own review and analysis it is recommended that you obtain independent legal, accounting, and tax advice from licensed professionals.